So, hi folks, uh, Andreas Metzen here from Capo Momentum Advisory. Today, another special day because NASA and SpaceX are going to launch, hopefully, the crew mission here in a few hours. I think it's two. So I took the opportunity uh, just to go live again here with this uh, crew update. I've been following the uh, preparations uh, and uh, we'll come do some commentary on the side and show some maybe some interesting stuff on the side. So without further ado, uh, let me switch over here to uh, to the actual update. I'm using uh, NASA's channel here uh, to uh, to comment uh, and and I will turn. We saw the same we with four suits all passing their lead mission, checks, which is then even gonna, though C3 is uh, help still in the same family, going on to the moon is and then on to Mars. Jana, thank you so much. And we actually just integrity. heard a call out there. So at this time, we are going to the... proceed with the count uh, and move into Section 5 uh, for side hatch closure delay any other troubleshooting steps until we get on orbit. How copy. Okay, that's great news. Dragon copy, and we are going to continue into section three of 4.100. So you heard there the yeah sorry so you heard uh, the commentary there uh, the crew is inside uh, the Dragon caps already uh, they're waiting for launch uh, T minus one hour fifty two minutes and some seconds um, they just did a leak check on the suits so they check that their suits that the astronauts are wearing are actually airtight they had to double check some zippers and just went through that process right now. So uh, the count was picked up again, and um, everything should be uh, uh, running smooth going forward here. I will actually move myself over here. Well, maybe I'll leave myself, just put myself a bit higher. Anyway, I'll leave myself here. It's not about me, it's about the group. So you see the, I will turn up the volume from the commentary here. So they're waiting to seal the, the hatch here. And uh, you see the technician standing around going through the checklist, uh, documenting things like they just said. Um, uh, they will close the hatch and then they will uh, make sure that the hatch is uh, airtight. Uh, that's also a step in the process that's coming up here soon. Now this is... Uh, Yeah, they also, when the astronauts go in, they don't want to, you know, hit themselves. So they just put some padding there that everything is um, not damaged going in. How we've had this continued presence on the ISS for 22 years. What do you think of that legacy? Yeah, sorry, I had the audio off actually. I turned the audio back on. The 3,000 investigations that we have done, scientific uh, uh, things. And, and so this is the, the NASA administrator talking. I will uh, turn off the audio. Remember to put it back on next time. 
Uh, I'm going to go over here now and um, and oops, sorry, didn't want to pause that. Um, and look at NASA's uh, SpaceX's feed. That's about the same. You see here the picture of uh, the capsule on top of the Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, I'm still uh, amazed by that we have come so far. SpaceX has taken us so far so that we're ready for space and can finally travel again. And the US has the capability of taking the astronauts to uh, ISS and also the International Space Station and also into space as, as a whole. In such a uh, economic way, usability of the rocket. Um, so we're inside, they're on site. Uh, they're on top of the Falcon 9 um, um, rocket that can actually uh, land. Um, they have already 176 total launches and 136 uh, landings already on this uh, Falcon 9 uh, with total uh, number of reflights of 115. So uh, great stats on reusability, exactly like uh, Elon Musk had, had imagined it. Um, so this is the whole thing. And the beauty on top of this mission, the capsule is, the Dragon capsule is on top of here for this mission. So roughly 70 meters, um, 200, over 200 feet tall with uh, the, the cargo on top here in this version. Um, just magnific magnific magnificent that we can uh, finally travel again. That's what it will look like hopefully here in less uh, than two hours. Uh, taking off here and taking the astronauts to the ISS. It has the Merlin engines, uh, like you may be aware, um, one of the most sophisticated uh, engines ever to be built by human beings. Uh, just fascinating pictures, you know, the whole science fiction and everything that uh, <laughs> mood that comes along with this capability. It's just, uh, it's just plain awesome. So uh, this is a bit on, on uh, the actual uh, on the actual uh, uh, rocket that we're on. This is the Dragon capsule. Uh, so you see a close up here approaching the space station. Um, total launches uh, of this already uh, 30, 35, uh, visits to the ISS uh, 32. Um, so you see this capsule here uh, that the astronauts are currently inside waiting uh, for launch, doing the checks. Um, the capsules, very science, uh, science fiction like uh, seats, different than in like um, uh, the old, the old rockets that we used to fly. Uh, quite comfortable with uh, LED screens in front of it, touch screens, and so forth. Uh, with suits that look uh, very modern. The Dragon capsule has a Draco um, thrusters. Uh, to maneuver, and it actually, when it comes back, it touches down in the water. It doesn't uh, land on ground. Uh, you see here the arm, service arm uh, towards the the capsule. So let's go back. Let's go back to uh, uh, the news, uh, the live feed here from NASA. And on Akikana, a direct handover also helps ensure continuous U.S. presence on the space station, a record we've held almost 22 years. So you see them closing the up the hatch. Space station is an orbiting laboratory, and they will jump right into research and investigation. Doing all sorts of checks. Now I'll toss it over uh, to Daryl at the Kennedy to Space Center. Make sure they're closing it correctly. With a little bit more of that science. The, the Darryl, check that it's actually airtight. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Shaniqua. And we continue to monitor the uh, closure of the hatch on the Crew Dragon. You see the closeout team there. I want to take a closer look now at some of the life-changing science the astronauts are performing aboard the International Space Station. The International Space Station is a state-of-the-art microgravity laboratory that is unlocking discoveries not possible on Earth and helping us push farther into deep space. Every single day, we are answering big questions about Earth and about space, about where we came from and about where we're going. But the other thing that we're doing is we're learning more questions to ask. Microgravity turns almost everything we know upside down. Liquids behave completely differently. Fire burns in new ways. Biological systems reveal surprises. There's a few things that have made me gasp out loud up on board Space Station watching heart cells actually beat has been a pretty big one. We're studying ways to grow food in microgravity. i got to tell you, these, uh, these are pretty amazing. We're learning how human bodies react to life in space. 
and how to keep crew members safe and strong on long duration exploration missions. Deadlifts are awesome on Earth. They're also awesome in zero gravity. We're testing technologies that will be critical to our return to the moon and great leap to Mars. Our research has contributed to medical and social benefits on our home planet, allowing us to find new ways to combat disease back on Earth and develop technologies to deliver clean water to remote communities in need. The spectacular vantage point of more than 200 miles above our planet supports our monitoring of Earth's climate, natural disasters, and plant life. The orbital perspective that we have here on the ISS is just absolutely amazing. Earth is gorgeous. The growing new space economy, so vital to our continued progress in space, is flourishing in low Earth orbit. We're inspiring future generations from a platform that is one of the largest international collaborations of our time. We're doing science at 17,500 miles per hour. Come along for the ride. So much about what these missions are about is the science. And even though, Bob, you were telling me, test flight, um, that of course it was historic at the time, reestablishing America's presence to launch from American soil, get to the space station. You didn't have a lot of science on your flight, but when you got up there, there was a lot of science to do, right? Even a backlog. Absolutely, Daryl. You know, for my guest, for my launch guest, even though it was a test flight that we were headed to the space station to check out a new vehicle, my T-shirt said, because science. <laughs> and that was the reason that we were going. And uh, I was proud to be a part of the, uh, when I arrived at space station, of the science that we were able to accomplish. As, as you mentioned, there was a bit of a backlog. We had a single U.S. crew member. And uh, Doug and I were put into service right away <laughs> trying to support. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt the audio here and uh, talk over uh, what's uh, visually to be seen. So they're still, um, you know, checking the hatch to to be able to close it, um, and countdown is still keep going on. They will check that the uh, air latch is uh, airtight. Um, Yeah, they talk about the science projects now. I want to uh, take this opportunity while they're kind of filling the gaps here uh, of time, um, and um, uh, move over. Uh, I want to show you this picture. This is a, uh, I paused one of the other uh, live feeds here. Uh, this is the, not the wrong, not the correct time up here. So this is how they sit inside the uh, the the capsule here. Um, I want to go back to uh, uh, SpaceX's view here uh, and show some some more things maybe that uh, that I can that I can find here. Uh, SpaceX is currently also building Starship, uh, so uh, they have a current prototype uh, fifteen. This will be the big one. Uh, ultimately, go to Mars uh, and uh, Moon. Um, just massive, uh, just massive rocket uh, with a super heavy rocket below, and then the Starship on top. Um, just absolutely mad, complete height of 120 meters. Um, that's uh, going to be really exciting seeing um, uh, th that one go up once. I will I will cover kind of uh, while they're talking about science projects, I find this one a bit more intriguing to attach, to look forward to in way in the, uh, way in the future of what they are and showing here. By sending small cells this is an update on tiny uh, build of Starship. Up to space to understand how those individual systems respond to that environment so that we can design more effective therapeutics for use here on Earth. And just bear with me. We also have experiments launching on Crew-5, going up with the crew today, that are going to explore the effects of microgravity on the gut. So I'm going to turn off the audio of this one and let this one play. Um, This is, uh, oh, I actually wasn't expecting it to be this windy. Hopefully you can actually hear what I'm saying. So this is an hour and 15, uh, okay, so I'm going to kind of skip through here. Um. Separation confirmed. So this is uh, flight so, data from so Falcon 1. We thought, yeah. From Falcon 1 back then. Yeah, Falcon 1. So let's go here, yeah. maybe was, fish for you know, some. something to capture the imagination, get people excited some, about space. Some clips here. Uh, to orbit and back. So this is, this is a that you can produce. Um, 
And you want some lift, especially when you're in the upper atmosphere, mostly so that you yeah, don't so you can control the maximum. This will be a starship how it will hover um, down. Lift to keep yourself high in the, the low density portion of the atmosphere so you can So this is the future velocity. And that's what it might look like then. I really wish uh, SpaceX got speed off for all these uh, they have pushed pushed us um, to new heights in terms of uh, really new heights. So this is showing Starship getting refueled. Uh, so you could put uh, orbital refueling. Yeah. Or, 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 orbital refueling is extremely important for getting to Mars and getting to the Moon. It's for establishing a city. To yeah. So you would have you know uh, fuel ships up in, in orbit and then have space uh, Starship come by. They dock. You fuel and then you know you have fuel again to go all the way to Mars and you could have a whole fleet that's uh, ultimately the idea to send fleets of uh, ships so I just want to show this um, as a you know uh, projection into the future of uh, where these uh, missions will head eventually so over here um, the hatch has been closed uh, I'm going to turn back the audio from uh, from this uh, for feed. people who suffer from those diseases and Apologies. Since had the opportunity through ISS National Lab and, and NASA to operate four different experiments in space. So this new era of easy access to space for support of science that benefits here on Earth is really turning into to some new great dividends for people on Earth. So uh, hatch, hatch is closed. They will do uh, an airtight check now. Thanks, Daryl. All right, as we continue to watch the operation and our team checked through the milestones here. We will toss it back out to Houston. Actually, we're going to throw it to California and Hawthorne, where Sandra and Jesse are standing by. Thanks, Daryl. Earlier, we did talk about the progress that both NASA and SpaceX have made in human spaceflight since we first started flying Dragon regularly over 10 years ago. So to support our increasing number of human spaceflight missions, your spacesuit team has been busy at work, Jesse. <laughs> yes, we have. You might be surprised to know that the completion of the Crew-5 suits marks SpaceX's 50th completed IVA or intravehicular activity suit, including development, training, and qualification suits. 30 of those suits were created for flight. This number is inclusive of the suits that the Crew-5 astronauts are wearing today. 17 of the 50 were built and used for development and training. One was used to get our suit qualified for space, and we produced suits to support the passengers for a couple demonstration missions as well. You may recall. So you see um, the astronauts. Falcon Heavy flight in 2018. Yeah, they were sitting there with all the picture, and um, this is Elon Musk's Tesla in space here. And as a reminder, this spacesuit that you've seen the crew wearing throughout operations today is an intravehicular activity suit designed for use inside Dragon. Its primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin depressurization. Now, when the astronauts move onto the International Space Actually, Station following dock... Looks like the astronaut on the left, uh, forgive me, I don't know his name. <laughs> looks like he was sleeping, actually. <laughs> Taking a little meditation second there. So you see they have, uh, you don't see actually, but uh, what they're looking at, uh, they have a screen in front of them that they can also see all the data in a way and checks being performed. Uh, and uh, and you see also kind of the limits on their um, on their movability inside uh, when they're locked there in their seats, so to say. On them for demo two. Some improvements include the patterning process for better fit, Patterns are the individual pieces of fabric that go together to create the suit. Our process involves taking measurements, generating patterns based on those measurements for each layer of the suit, and then performing fit checks where we put together non-flight quick versions of the different layers of the suit to make sure that they fit correctly before making the flight suit. Now we've also continued custom patterns for each crew member and have made significant reliability upgrades in the spacesuits. And while the suit is a single piece, which means the helmet, gloves, and boots all remain attached as one piece, 
With us today is a SpaceX helmet lent to us by the spacesuit team, and you can see it here on the table right now. That's right, Sandra. This helmet is made from 3D printed nylon and has a visor that pivots open. And Dragon SpaceX for side hatch leak checks. Yeah, finally, the leak checks. Okay, Josh, uh, we identified a uh, potential piece of FOD on the side hatch seal when we were inspecting everything, so the closeout team is proceeding to open the hatch to address that before closing and reperforming the leak check. For big picture awareness, we still have approximately uh, 12 minutes remaining in the margin for this timer to perform this action, so we'll, we'll be able to run through everything without uh, issue here. Yeah, so they uh, so they had this problem. So in other uh, flights here, with uh, they have to reopen the hatch uh, and address an issue here. Um, we were closing the hatch. It sounds like they do need to do another inspection, reopen the hatch, reinspect uh, the hatch lining, make sure that there's no FOD caught in there, and then perform the procedure to reclose the hatch one more time. Uh, it sounds like we do have some margin, um, 12 minutes of margin, so we are still on track for liftoff today. Uh, but as we were mentioning, the helmet is made from 3D printed nylon and has a vi visor that pivots open. It's also equipped with a microphone, which is embedded into the helmet, which allows the crew to communicate with the mission operators while suited and seated in Dragon. That's right, and those communication systems that you were talking that you were talking about you can see um, inside they're not inside this helmet because it's not going to be used throughout the mission um, but the crew does have the ability to hear via the helmet um, and you can see the slots right there uh, for for that capability yeah um, and so now we're gonna check in with Kate while the team is working on the hatch so Kate how's it going over there Thanks, Jesse. Yeah, it's super cool to see that helmet up close. Uh, now turning our attention back to the progress with the integrated launch teams, uh, we are coming up on T minus one hour and 32 minutes. Uh, as we just heard a couple of moments ago, the closeout team identified uh, a little bit of FOD in that hatch seal. Um, so basically the process is we close the side hatch, we inflate the seal around the hatch uh, to a certain pressure, and then we hold that pressure to see if there's any decay or leak. Um, and if there is, that's an indication that something is in the seal, and that's what occurred today. So the team is in the process of reopening the hatch. They'll clean the seal out, close it and inflate the seal and re-perform that leak check. Uh, so normal, as we heard mentioned, we do have 12 minutes of margin in the launch countdown. As I've mentioned before, the countdown is to make sure that everybody is, uh, all the integrated launch teams are aligned uh, and we do build margin in in order to make sure that at, we can deal with things like this as they come up. Similar to whenever uh, pilot Josh, Josh Cassida had um, a little bit of decay, or excuse me, not decay, a lower pressure value red on his suit, so we rechecked the uh, the suit pressure there as well. So working through those, uh, no issues. We're still tracking for an on, uh, for launch today. Um, and as you can see, the crew seated there comfortably in the capsule. It looks like Anna might be taking a little uh, pre-launch nap. Uh, I don't know if I personally would be able to pull that off, so I really admire the calmness that she's <laughs> demonstrating today. Um, so once that hatch is closed back up and we successfully uh, leak check on that, yeah, so uh, we should I be think I was. Uh, we see some movement there. She's not. I, I thought I was right that I saw her closing her eyes. At least it looks like she was uh, closing her eyes. Uh, the one that closes her, her visor here right now. So you see that they're going to open, check the. Uh, and then they can measure if the air comes out and that the pressure is still on. Uh, they take it very precise. You know, this is uh, lives at risk and uh, expensive equipment. Uh, so they they do it 100 percent, or they don't do it at all. 
today is underway. So um, the SpaceX chief engineer, uh, who for this mission is Dan Alex, uh, he will check in with the team at T minus 80 minutes to verify that we are good to continue with the countdown. Now, the next major activity, uh, we will flow a small amount of fuel into the first stage to prime those Merlin 1D engines for ignition. Uh, the team is also monitoring fuel and liquid oxygen loading preparations, ensuring that the propellants in the ground takes uh, are correctly chilled to uh, prior, loading, prior to loading them onto Falcon 9. Uh, propellant load will begin at T minus 35 minutes. Uh, now at just under T minus one hour and 30 minutes ourselves, the weather continues to be green, as you can see, beautiful clear day at pad 39A, but we are of course monitoring. You see weather, on the right uh, the structure here well, for and that continues to the structure for a starship uh, with this big crane next to it. You can see that in comparison to the sizes here, it's just uh, massive from now, uh, and we are certainly getting excited here in Hawthorne. Uh, with that, let's turn it back over to Daryl and Bob at Kennedy Space Center. How's it going over there, guys? All right, thank you very much, Kate, and we continue to monitor the work that the closeout team is doing right there, uh, checking, rechecking uh, the seal to drag in between the hatch and the spacecraft, and there you can see the techs making that inspection now, taking a light around it. They had the hatch closed but reopened it after doing the side hatch leak check. And Bob, it was interesting, we were talking about this uh, just briefly before uh, Kate threw to us, and there's a way they can check that seal to see if there's any FOD in it. And I thought it was interesting how they do that. Well, yes, uh, Daryl, Kate gave a great explanation of uh, that process uh, just a couple minutes ago, but what they do is they, they need to find a way, of course, uh, before you get into space to make sure that the integrity of that seal is good. And so what they do is they're able to inflate a small portion, a, a small volume, to ensure that they do have a good pressurization on the sides of that seal. And if they do have a leak or, or some indication that things aren't exactly right, you know, the most likely culprit is some sort of foreign object that's kind of captured in that sealing surface. And so the team goes back in, cleans that area out, and uh, then we'll kind of reaccomplish that leak check to make sure that it's good before the crew gets into the vacuum of space with the spacecraft. And you can see they've wrapped up that process of inspecting, cleaning, and documenting the seal. And now they've reclosed the side hatch to Crew Dragon with our Crew 5 astronauts inside, and they'll start sealing up the hatch now. I've, I found that uh, since it's so dependent on this, you know, you see 12 minutes, it's, I mean, there's still some. Closeout team was able to open the side hatch and remove the uh, hair that they identified as FOD. They've closed behind it the side hatch and they're stepping into their leak checks right now. We are right on schedule for launch today. Tracking copies, that's great news, and we're standing by for that leak check. Thanks. Yeah, I find it that this leak check is so dependent. Uh, um, you know, I, I find it uh, um, a single point of failure of a mission you know, for this uh, seal leak. Um, I wonder if they will um, find a way to create this or make this process so that uh, there's not these uh, independent uh, dependencies on on a hair or on a speck of dust, so to say. To uh, so, but anyway, um, let's hope. Expect a momentary flight computer state change, followed by that transition back to pad hatch closed. Dragon copies. We'll expect it again prior to going back to pad hatch closed. Good readback. So you see, you know, the technicians here with uh, tablets, uh, looking at checklists, looking at uh, going through the checklist. So it's we're still a bit far away from science science fiction type of launches where it's just you get in and you go off. Uh, it's a bit more complicated still uh, for us uh, to 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 do it, um, and probably will remain like this. Um, but anyway. Excited to have uh, the Lieutenant General here with me today. Uh, I mean, it's just, I'm so honored to be sitting next to you here. I wanted to ask you, is this your first crewed launch that you've seen? Oh, no, no, Megan. Uh, I was here before when we had uh, commercial launch number two. So I always just love to see a launch. 
Absolutely. Having done four missions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, does being here, does it make you kind of reminisce on, on those four missions you've had? You know, you're part of the Gemini and, and Apollo programs, and we actually have some, some pictures of you from those missions that we'd love to share with everyone. Can you talk us through what this oh, picture yeah. is? <laughs> here we are right after we've landed on Gemini 9. That was in June 6, 1966. There's Gene Cerny, my pilot. He's the first one to walk in space completely around the world. We did three different rendezvous on that. And we also touched down closer than any Gemini or Apollo. Wow. So and then we have another picture, actually. This one's from Apollo 10, right? And that's you, the second astronaut um, farthest from the uh, transport van, right? Right. So the... Uh, yeah, com compare those suits to today's suits. You know, uh, they have these... Casters there that they have to carry around, you know, come. It's been a while since then. Um, down to nine miles above the lunar surface, photo map, radar map, and visually map, picked out an ellipse that had three potential landing sites. He did that twice and came up and did the first rendezvous around the moon. Yeah. And then on the way back, set the all time world speed record. At this this picture is a little blurry, but it's honestly my favorite of the three pictures. Can you tell us what's happening here? You guys are on your way to the moon here, right? We're on our way to the moon. We're walking slow to, walking slow to the transfer van. <laughs> but then on the way back, we're doing, uh, well, 24,791 miles an hour, or th Mach 36 miles per second, Megan. Seven miles a second. Wow, wow. So that record still stands. Wow. You know, we're talking about the Apollo 10 mission and, 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 and the work that you guys were able to, to establish to get us where we are today with our Artemis 1 moon rocket right behind us in the Vehicle Assembly Building. Are you looking forward to the Artemis 1 launch later this year? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I've worked on helping getting that through Congress back in 2010. That's the authorization that authorized it. So, um, yeah, I've had 12 years of work on that one. Yes. Lieutenant General, thank you so much for being here, and I hope you enjoy the Crew 5 launch today. Well, it's great to be here. The weather's good, and I'm sure you're going to have a great launch. Man. Thank you so much. All right, Darrell, we'll send it back to you. Well, well, that was fantastic to hear from the Ground Lieutenant Dragon General. Loud and clear. Stand by from ComCheck by Launch Control. Dragon, Launch Control on Countdown 1, ComCheck. Launch control, Dragon, loud and clear. Launch control, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the chief engineer. We're getting comm check right Dragon, CE on countdown one, comm check. Listening in. CE, Dragon, loud and clear. CE, loud and clear. Also, this completes the Falcon 9 responsible engineer comm checks. There will be a series of these checks. Establishing a number of communication paths to the crew from launch control. Want to just uh, update you really quick. We got a good side hatch leak check. Again, a good side hatch leak check after some FOD was found that compromised it following the first closure. Teams went back in, opened the hatch, cleaned off the seal. Shut the hatch back, rechecked the seal, and we are good to go. Again, good side leak, side hatch leak check, and we're moving forward now with the comm checks. That's good news. That's really good news. Um... Quickly, they had 12 minutes of margin. They whittled that down to about three or four minutes. And so great job by them. Tackling that issue that can pop up as you're preparing to launch a spacecraft to the International Space Station. That's a gorgeous There's view. There's the Falcon 9 rocket on the pad with the Dragon spacecraft atop. We've got a beautiful day. Nice skies above. Take a little moment to listen to a special message now from somebody who's familiar to both of us, more him than me. Our previous co-host from the last crew mission, crew four, and the launch broadcast. A very special person to all of us here. Let's take a listen. 
Hello, husband. It looks like you're doing a great job with the launch commentary. Keep up the great work. It seems like all those tips that I gave you are paying off. Um, a couple of things I forgot to mention, though. You should probably share some of your snacks with Daryl because he does get a little hangry if he doesn't get enough to eat. And also, it's important as the co-host to make sure you laugh and smile at all of his jokes. It makes him feel really good. Um, actually, there's a couple other people in the family that want to say hello to you as well. Just give me, just give me one second. <laughs> Do a good job, Daddy, or else I will find new ways to motivate you. In all seriousness though, Nicole and Josh and Koichi and Anna, I wanna wish you well on your journey. You guys have worked so hard to get here. You're going to be absolutely outstanding on the International Space Station. I cannot wait to see you up there. We're gonna be cheering you on from down here. Have a blast and we'll see you when you get home. Oh, what a beautiful message. She's so good with the camera and giving the message. Thank you so much to Megan MacArthur for saying that. Uh, by the way, I've taken care of myself. I've got my food here. But uh, it's so good to see her and, and uh, a little touched by her message. No, it was absolutely great to see my wife, of course, our, our dog Shadow, who arrived in our family after we uh, returned from the Demo 2 mission. You know, my son requested Dragon approval. SpaceX, we just had a good side hatch leak check. My son requested a approval to have a dog when uh, the mission was accomplished. And so that was pretty cool to have the dog included. And, of course, uh, Darth Vader making a guest <laughs> appearance, uh, not something that I expected. But uh, that costume has a little bit of history. We surprised Megan uh, during the mission on board the, her time on Space Station. So I'm going to just with lay over and, uh, uh, a live view of one on board Space Station ISS and us right back. Um, oh, about that. looking down at Earth. So that's and, actually uh, where the space capsule Capsule is going to head, uh, given successful <laughs> launch, they will head towards uh, he may have heard that the ISS. Line, uh, so from this is both his mother and myself. Uh, this is uh, the view from ISS down to Earth, a bit cloudy, um, but that's the view. Uh, looking down, you see, depending on when the resolution is better, you see actually the cloud formation. So that's pretty, um, that's pretty neat actually. Is, uh, moving forward, with a beautiful shot of there of uh, Dragon as we look out over the Atlantic. We've got some social media questions, and we asked you to submit them. Uh, we've had a little action that we've been dealing with this morning, so haven't been able to do a whole lot of questions, but we're going to start getting to them now. And at Con asks, what kind of personal items can the crew take with them to the International Space Station? No, Daryl, it's a great question and one that we get asked often. Uh, what kind of personal items can the crew take with them? Um, usually it's something small is probably the best answer to that question. But they're items that are per personal mementos of, of family members or otherwise. Uh, you saw my son earlier in the Darth Vader costume. <laughs> um, as you can tell, Star Wars has a special place in our family. And so we were able to glue together a small Lego ship and have my wife take that into space. Oh. Uh, I took one uh, during, during my mission as well so that we would have something that he could connect with that was part of our family, something to talk about, you know, during our, our, our family conferences. Uh, there, are, there are many small items with individuals that you want to make a personal connections with that, that typically the, the crew will take with them. They also may take something that's special to them that allows them to either remember Earth or uh, take advantage of a hobby that they have, whether it's a guitar or uh, other musical instrument, uh, small items like that. It's, it must be nice to have that connection back to Earth and your family uh, because of, uh, you know, you're up there in space and especially now with these long duration space missions lasting six months. And it's interesting, you mentioned the small effects. Uh, Commander Nicole Mann um, taking her wedding rings, but also some surprise special gifts for her family and a dream catcher. So I'm just going to overlay this here. Her when she was a child. That's a this is uh, current ISS position. Get about 3.3 pounds. So the target uh, actually of this mission uh, uh, so going nice to ISS uh, ultimately. Part so you see here a uh, better view uh, looking down from ISS and where it's currently uh, in South, uh, South America here. So that's where the astronauts are going to hit. Uh, Considering that things go well now with the launch here.
suit leak checks were completed, as well as comms checks completed with the Corps and the launch director. Yeah, I'm just going to hover over here, another view of ISS over the and South Pacific Ocean. Checks, the closeout so team was able this, to close and the astronauts the on top here will find themselves hopefully soon uh, after a little day of, half day of travel here of uh, to ISS, the hatch, they did and then they can enjoy this view down on Earth. We were able to open it so ISS at the, the current altitude of 426 kilom uh, kilometers. Uh, Washing by here at uh, 20,700 kilometers an hour, uh, just amazing speeds here. And those final weather checks will be coming up soon, uh, which will be necessary before a final go, no go. And there you can see the closeout team there on your screen. Again, just wrapping up the final procedures for Hatch closure there. Yeah, things will become a bit more hectic now with uh, um, one after the other event now pulling off uh, with T minus an hour and 13 minutes and 50 seconds. Thanks, Jesse. The team here in Mission Control Houston has polled that they are go for the launch. The International Space Station and its onboard crew are ready for Crew-5 astronauts to lift off. When Flight Director Greg Whitney polled his team, he was asking the flight controllers who work on all the different systems on board the space station if their focus areas were online and working properly. This includes life support systems, proper communication links, computers that allow us to command the station on board and their subsystems, and our ability to maneuver the space station are fully functional. The crew in orbit is awake and just finished their midday meals. They will start crew arrival preparations shortly, making sure they are ready to receive the new crew tomorrow. Mission Control Houston will continue monitoring the mission as we check off milestones for today's flight. In the meantime, I'll send it back over to Hawthorne. The International Space Station Flight Control Room is ready for launch. Sandra? Thank you. Thanks, Janiqua. That's great news. And while Crew-5 is launching today, just a few months ago, we were launching another crew to the International Space Station. That is, of course, Crew-4, who launched in April. The Crew-4 astronauts currently on board the International Space Station have spent nearly six months conducting scientific research in areas such as material science, health technologies, and plant science to prepare for human exploration beyond low Earth orbit and to benefit life on Earth. Such research also lays the groundwork for future exploration of the Moon and Mars, starting with the agency's Artemis missions. Dr. Cho Lingren was born in Okay, Tepe, I'm just going to step aside Taiwan, here for a second, so uh, I'll be back in a second. Go ahead and enjoy the stream. In England. He was an instructor and jump master with the U.S. Air Force Academy and also has a doctorate in medicine and served as a NASA flight surgeon. After he was chosen as an astronaut, Lingren flew on Soyuz and spent 141 days in space during Expedition 44 and 45. He has a wife and three children and is the commander of Dragon Freedom. And up next is fellow airman Bob Hines. He was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and has a wife and three daughters. He has a Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering and served 21 years in the U.S. Air Force as a test pilot and as a fighter pilot in the F-15E. He came to NASA as a research pilot where he flew the science where he flew science missions in the WB-57. He's the pilot for NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 mission, which has been his first space flight. Now there's a couple mission specialists on board Crew-4, one of which is Jessica Watkins, who considers Lafayette, Colorado her hometown. A talented rugby player in college, her team won the national championship in 2008. Watkins was a postdoctoral fellow in the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences at the California Institute of Technology. She completed several internships with NASA, including one testing system designs for the Mars Perseverance mission at JPL. She became an astronaut in 2017, and just like Bob, Crew-4 was her first flight to space. 
And the second mission specialist is Samantha Cristoforetti. She was born in Milan, Italy, but now lives in Cologne, Germany with her partner and two children. In 2006, she earned her fighter pilot wings and flew the AMX attack fighter pilot fighter at a base in Italy. In 2013, Cristoforetti launched into space aboard a Soyuz for a long duration space flight to the International Space Station. And several years later, she was awarded the Knight Grand Cross of the Order of Merit from the President of Italy. Crew 4 was her second space flight. This four-person crew is currently preparing for Crew 5's arrival and also their return back to Earth just days from now. And while Crew 4 was on board, they received a visit from another Dragon. SpaceX's 25th resupply mission to the International Space Station launched on July 14th, carrying over 5,800 pounds of science, research, hardware, and other crew supplies to the orbiting laboratory. Dragon stayed on station for a little over a month before being packed with critical research and hardware to be analyzed after a safe splashdown off the coast of Florida on August 20th. Now let's head over to Daryl at Kennedy Space Center. Daryl, how are you guys doing over there? Well, thank you, Jesse and Sandra. Well, we're having a beautiful day here at the Kennedy Space Center. You can see behind us, we're at the Launch Complex 39, where media are gathering, getting ready to count down the final hour as we get ready to watch Crew 5 launch into space. It is a big day. And especially here at the Kennedy Space Center, where we have just been cranking out the launches, Bob, Three launches in three days from three different pads. We had uh, the Atlas V going off from 40 yesterday. We've got Crew 5, of course, from Launch Complex 39A today. And then tomorrow, SpaceX launching from their other launch pad, Pad 41. Top Hi, folks. I'm back. Outstanding uh, to see all that action down here. Take at care of something Space real Center. quick. And again, it's a beautiful day. I'm looking forward to seeing the Crew 5 uh, folks uh, get into orbit. Indeed, and liftoff time is still holding for noon Eastern time, 56 seconds after noon, if you want to be right on the second. We're also tracking no issues at the moment with Falcon 9 or Dragon. We did have an additional suit leak check that we performed, as well as a spacecraft leak check. Those are good to go. Dragon now good to go. The range is green. And, of course, the weather is doing fabulous here at the Kennedy Space Center. Downrange, they're watching some winds in the, uh, the abort uh, corridor, but they're looking good right now. And so the crew of Crew 5, talking about Commander Nicole Mann, Pilot Josh Cassida, and Mission Specialist Koichi Wakata and Nana Kikana, well, they donned their spacesuits in the historic crew quarters suit-up room this morning. They woke up around 4.30 a.m., donned those suits around 7 a.m. They walked out of the crew quarters building as every NASA astronaut has done since Apollo 7. And then they were transported to the pad where they climbed inside the SpaceX Dragon Endurance for its second flight. And now we are seeing them live while they await liftoff. Bob, you live this with your fellow astronaut, Doug Hurley. What is the crew doing right now at this moment? You know, Daryl, it's a, it's a good question at this point. I think you can see on the camera that what the crew is really focused on right now is uh, relaxing. You know, they've had a hectic morning, if you will, one that's very well scripted, one that's very well controlled, but one that causes them to need to be on schedule through all the individual milestones leading up to launch. That part's behind them now, and they're taking a chance to relax and catch their breath uh, before the tanking operations begin here in uh, just a few minutes. Indeed, tanking coming up as well as the launch escape system checkout and the arming that will follow. The rocket is on the pad, ready to go. And over the next hour, we will conduct a series of polls to get ready for launch. The crew will also, as I mentioned, will be arming that launch escape system and then the fueling of Falcon 9 will begin. Let's talk a little bit about the details of today's flight. Launch, of course, as we mentioned, set for a, just a few seconds after noon, a little more than an hour from now, and then Crew-5 astronauts will race towards space, reaching orbit in about 12 minutes. That's followed by a roughly 29-hour flight to dock with the International Space Station, one of the longer transit times to the ISS, and then that docking will happen at 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow, and, of course, we'll have coverage of that. 
a quick history of NASA's commercial crew program. It all began with the first successful and historic test flight Dragon of SpaceX. Crew the closeout team has departed the crew arm, and with that, ground is going to cycle the orbit tank isolation valve to equalize low flow pressure. Dragon tank. All right, they're cycling the valve there and as well. Closeout team is now departing that location that you see, 39A. They'll be uh, making their way off the pad, and that'll lead us into getting ready to fuel the rocket. Of course, I was talking about the historic test flight for my uh, partner here and co-host, Bob Benkin. His crewmate, Doug Hurley. Together, they flew the mission that was called Demo 2. And uh, after Bob and Doug returned, of course, NASA was certified uh, with SpaceX to fly astronauts regularly to and from the International Space Station. And, of course, that led to the regular rotational missions that we see today, the fifth rotational mission to the International Space Station. Let's check in now with Kate Tice in California. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, quick status update for those that have recently tuned in. We've had a smooth countdown so far today. That you can see there on your screen are four Crew-5 astronauts have ingressed. They are in their seats. Their five-point safety harness is buckled in, and uh, they are looking relaxed and ready to go. Uh, they ingressed about an hour and 45 minutes ago, um, and the teams have completed the required comm checks, the suit leak checks, the side hatch closure, and its associated leak check. We did have to redo that leak check as a piece of FOD uh, was found in the seals. So we opened the hatch back up, uh, cleared out the seal, cleaned it, and then uh, closed the hatch again and reperformed that leak check, and we got good leak check there. Um, and we heard just moments ago that the closeout team is beginning to depart the pad. Uh, and at that point in time, it'll just be the crew five astronauts left on the pad once the closeout team departs the BDA. Uh, at this point in time, I'm happy to report that the SpaceX team is working no issues, uh, and the pace is certainly beginning to pick up. As for Falcon 9, our two-stage reusable rocket, final propulsion checkouts of the first and second stages, and the engine began a few minutes ago in preparation for propellant loading. Uh, this involves testing and cycling valves and engine pneumatics pressurization. At T40, at T minus 45 minutes, the team will report their readiness for prop load with a final electronic go no go pull. Again, that prop load will begin at T minus 35 minutes. Uh, as for Dragon, before we can start loading propellant on Falcon 9, we still have a few Dragon-related tasks to perform. Uh, first, we need to retract the crew access arm away from the Dragon capsule. We can see it there, uh, currently connecting the crew tower to the capsule. Uh, we will need to retract that access arm away to its launch position. Uh, that will happen between T minus 44 and 42 minutes, uh, so shortly coming up. That will, be the, that, that will be the last physical change to the crew tower. Um, with the access arm out of the way, the launch escape system will then be armed. Once those two events are complete, Dragon will be ready for uh, Falcon propellant loading. Uh, we did hear earlier uh, in one of the pre-launch briefs that once the launch escape system is armed, we will not have the ability to recycle. Uh, so we are basically locked in for launch today as soon as we have that launch system um, uh, armed. As for weather, we will also ver verify with the launch weather officer uh, that all the weather meets all of the associated constraints, including items such as wind speed, lightning, and precipitation. Um, <laughs> looks like with those beautiful blue sky behind Falcon and barely any clouds. Uh, we don't think rain is going to be an issue, nor lightning. Uh, now, we do expect uh, acceptable weather conditions for launch, both at surface level and upper altitudes. As I mentioned earlier, we have been watching those downrange winds, and they continue to trend favorably. So everything green there. As for the range, currently clear for launch from historic launch pad 39A, the worldwide network of ground stations and the tracking and data relay satellites, or TDRS as you hear us refer, uh, refer to it as, um, those are ready to support Dragon as it heads into orbit. 
Today we have an instantaneous launch window at 12 p.m. Eastern, noon on the dot. Uh, once we begin loading propellant, there is no opportunity to change that T0. The timing for Dragon to rendezvous with the International Space Station is incredibly precise down to the very second. So we only get one chance at it today. But at good news, at T minus one hour uh, on the dot and counting, we are go for launch. And we are now less than one hour until liftoff. This day is Dragon, the continued. You are go for section six. When ready, report go for launch. Dragon copies. We're stepping into T6 for decimal 100. Preparation for LES Army. Good readback. So again, we are now less than one hour until liftoff, and this day is the continuation of regular crew flights to the space station from U.S. soil. SpaceX's Crew-5 mission will be the company's sixth crewed space flight for NASA, following the crewed test flight Demo-2 and four previous operational crewed missions to the International Space Station. It will also be SpaceX's eighth crewed space flight overall, including the private orbital mission Inspiration-4. Today, our crew is flying on board Dragon Endurance. It will be the second flight for this capsule, and it will be taking a ride on a brand new Falcon 9. Now, it's been a great countdown so far. Weather, as Kate has been updating us with, is still good for T0, so the excitement just continues. Want to uh, pull to in here, here uh, as we get closer to that T0. Dragon in section six, crew five is go for launch. Hello, crew is go for launch. Um, so I wanted to pull in this um, view of how um, the Falcon 9 rocket actually will fly. So we'll have launch um, go up. There will be state separation and uh, the booster rocket will actually come back. It will flip and it will come back and uh, land on a drone ship. And then um, at one point, the uh, uh, capsule will separate and then uh, will take its uh, uh, path towards uh, the space station. I wanted to bring this to you. Watch the crew as they boarded their Teslas and headed down the NASA causeway, headed towards the launch pad. And once they arrived at the pad, the crew took a moment to enjoy the view of the vehicle as that they will be taking flight on uh, this afternoon and then headed up the fixed service structure to begin a process known as crew ingress where the astronauts entered the Dragon spacecraft. The SpaceX team then performed a series of checks to ensure the suits, seats and vehicle interactions were all functioning properly. And a short time ago. A short time ago, the team did close out Dragon's hatch, and the crew is safely inside. So with less than an hour to go until liftoff, things will continue to pick up as we get close to the go, no-go pole to arm the launch escape system and begin propellant loading. So I want to also show you here the interior of the, of the crew Dragon interior here from uh, SpaceX. Just bear with me here a second. So that's what it looks like inside uh, the Dragon capsule. So the astronauts are sitting on, they're looking up uh, the way the view, you saw them from uh, the current mission. You see the construction is uh, completely different than space shuttles you see the screens there this is going to be on top looking down into the capsule you know they have these footrests and then you will see in the moment i assume the screens um, so that was a, a view from um from spacex here um let me see yeah so i wanted to go i want to give this to you uh while they're talking uh, and the next checks are coming up here. Uh, let's just look quickly, Dragon Capsule inside. Um, we'll find something, we'll find some pictures, uh, respectively, maybe some, uh, let's look for videos. Um, let's do this quick one here. 
The Crew Dragon capsule is the spacecraft that houses the crew. It is replacing the Cargo Dragon capsule that was previously used on SpaceX resupply missions to the International Space Station. The Dragon spacecraft that we'll be using to carry astronauts to the space station and bring them home is really a 21st century spaceship. My first impression of the inside of Crew Dragon, I was amazed. It's obviously a modern space vehicle. It's very sleek design inside, very comfortable. Here you see the screen. The seats the... are actually car racing seats, so the safety factors go up considerably. We've flown Crew Dragon uh, already to the space station and back. We subsequently made a lot of changes, improvements, but we also just have to be absolutely paranoid about safety. Well, the experience of training in an accurate capsule with a spacesuit is invaluable. Bob and Doug wore their spacesuits in the simulation because we want training to be as flight-like as possible for them. Hey, SpaceX Dragon, we are ready to pressurize. When you have all your equipment on, it allows you to get more comfortable in a situation. So the more you can train in those suits, the better you'll be on the real day. It's exciting to see, you know, modern components in a spacecraft. You get very used to the shuttle, the 2000 switches, circuit breakers, the seats. It's not the most comfortable vehicle to fly in. You know, for yeah, those of us who've been living with switches this from the comparison. 60s for all these years, to see a modern interface is something that's pretty exciting. SpaceX Dragon, we've got two good LEDs. Copy all, Dragon. Some of the great innovations that we've made, we have uh, these wonderful touch screens, so you can see everything that's going on in the vehicle. You can get all the data that you need about the vehicle, and you can also control the vehicle all from these touch screens. The gloves are compatible with the touchscreen. It's imperative because there are operations you need to do with the gloves on. Our tablets are updated. The Dragon capsule is almost completely automated, so it should be able to fly the entire flight without us intervening at all if everything goes normally. And I think it's the way of the future with vehicles. I mean, we see that now with cars, we see it with airplanes, and this is just the next logical step. Yeah, I wanted to uh, give you that and show you this. Uh, we kind of get a feeling for the crew. Um, while we're waiting here for the next uh, checkpoints here, uh, it's going to get excited here in a moment. Um, the, once they uh, they make the escape system, uh, turn that on, uh, and then you're going to put uh, fuel inside, and then uh, things are going to go one after the other. So excited for this mission. Uh, also shows the reliability of uh, SpaceX's um, system here and the whole launch system from SpaceX. You're seeing that NASA has some issues with their SLS, uh, not being able to get that up into space. And um, uh, meanwhile, SpaceX is uh, humming along here uh, with uh, lots of Starlink missions, getting satellites up into orbit. And uh, now again, uh, the fifth um, flight here, um, with uh, supp uh, supplying astronauts uh, to the space station. So really cool stuff. Uh, it always excites me to to see the rocket standing up there. I've actually been to this site, uh, quite impressive. Uh, I have to understand that uh, all the fumes and exhaust, let's say, go into this tunnel here and it's you know diverted away. Uh, and then um, it's just a, a cool down, of course. And it's, a, it's just amazing to see this and they're sitting up on top here in this little capsule here. Um, so uh, let's listen back into the NASA feed here. We often get asked which vehicle is better uh, fly and build space station with a space shuttle, but then rotate as a crew member with the Dragon on a modern spacecraft. You know, that was a, a really neat aspect to see something that was kind of built in the 21st century versus something that was built, you know, in, in almost the middle of the 20th century. If you look back at the technology that was on board the shuttle, just super excited to have an opportunity to fly on such a cool modern new ship. And now next question at Mike Mangano. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Asked, and this is a, a fitting question for you, Bob. 
did the NASA astronauts who fly the Dragon capsule help in the design of the capsule? Why, yes, they did, and that was you. <laughs> You know, it's a, it's, it was an interesting experience, I think, for both uh, Doug and I to have the opportunity to not only fly on a new spacecraft, but be a part of shaping it for crews to come forward. And I think as we went through that process, the SpaceX team really learned how to work with us and how to take our inputs and incorporate them into design whenever they could and explain to us when they couldn't, because everything that we wanted, they couldn't necessarily do. But uh, we were able to compromise and come up with good solutions so that uh, years later, maybe in Crew 5's case, you know, they wouldn't be cursing Bob. Bob and Doug's name <laughs> as to what they had agreed to or said was acceptable uh, when the time came. We wanted to have opportunities for them to have choices. We included the opportunity to write on paper, but also to have a tablet, you know, so that crews, as they went forward with their missions, would be able to find the place that, you know, helped them be as successful as they could be. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that there just aren't too many curses associated with uh, <laughs> Bob and Doug. And it's mostly, you know, hey, those guys, uh, they were thinking when they did this. So, And we've had good results so far with... Uh, four launches and the fifth today. Our next question comes from at morearts.com. If the astronaut schedule shifts during docking activities, does their schedule shift later in the day or the next morning? You know, we do know that the, the ISS crew is sleep shifting in order to accommodate this crew. It's true, Daryl, that the, the crew actually has to sleep shift to accommodate the schedules of the vehicle traffic that arrives on board the space station. There are even times when the vehicle arrives a few minutes early or a few minutes late, and the crew needs to be ready for that as well. And so uh, the crew does shift their day around to support all the operational activities, not only vehicle traffic and arrivals, but uh, a spacewalk may impact things or, or other activities that are happening on the ground, for example, might drive a schedule to be specific as well. But the crew's given time to recover after each of those sleep shifts. Very good. And for those watching, if you want to ask a question of Bob Binkin, just follow us on Twitter at NASA Social or check us out on the web at nasa.gov forward slash social. Thanks for ask, or answering those questions, Bob. Great job. Let's send it now. Back out to Kate at SpaceX for an update on the countdown. Kate? Always love hearing those responses from any astronaut, but especially Bob because he flew uh, on our uh, DM2 mission uh, a couple years ago. Um, so at this point in time, we're now under an hour. We're at T minus 48 minutes, and the SpaceX launch team uh, is finishing the final review of data from checkouts of Falcon 9 over the last hour. The launch director uh, has verified with the launch weather officer that weather meets propellant loading constraints. So next up will be to pull the team for readiness, uh, both for propellant load and for launch. This will be the last pull before liftoff. The seven SpaceX responsible engineers, often called REs, indicate that they are go by electronically voting on the online countdown procedure. The launch director, or LD, as you hear it called on the nets, also checks with the Dragon mission director, or MD, and the NASA launch manager to make sure that they are also ready. Earlier, you saw the vehicle assembly building called the VAB. The Falcon and Dragon launch team, as well as key NASA launch members, are in the launch control center adjacent to the VAB. They have a view straight toward pad 39A through the large windows of firing room 4. Now there on screen, you can see the Dragon capsule on the right-hand side. The crew access arm is still in the service position. I've recently heard that the closeout team has departed the tower, and they are in the process of departing the blast danger area. Uh, now, with the crew on board Dragon waiting for next instructions, which will be to stow the crew arm for launch, uh, and uh, the crew arm sequence will be armed and initiated. We should get a good view of the access arm as it Engine swings. Engine operators on countdown. Pulling is complete. The team has pulled go for crew access arm retract LES arm. Propellant load and launch. For all operators in MCCX and firing room four, both control rooms will go into lockdown at T-minus 45 minutes and will remain in that state until launch skip system is disarmed. All operators are to remain at their console and maintain a sterile cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming of the launch scape system following orbit insertion or propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non-urgent no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD and they will approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, 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 countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence and immediately proceed into launch abort. The T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off, relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. 
Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fires imminent or occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. Launch control at this time you may proceed with arming the crew arm for movement. Launch control copies proceeding to arm crew arm for movement. Okay, so we'll see the arm retract here in a second. All right, quick so recap there. Structure All here. Really good news. Um, it sounds like the final poll has been conducted and all of the uh, responsible engineers pulled go, um, as well as the range they pulled ready for launch and the NASA team, um, for, or the NASA launch team uh, is also ready for launch. Uh, so everything continuing to look good. Uh, we just heard there that the crew arm, uh, excuse me, the crew access arm will be armed for retraction, meaning it will move away from the Dragon crew access capsule. arm retraction started. So All right, and there we should get some get action here now. Of that crew access arm now moving away from Dragon capsule. Again, this will swing out into its launch position. This is the final change to the this crew is just like at the airport. Arm, me, to the crew tower. Um, of course, the transporter erector will move away from the rocket as it lifts off uh, and just shortly before liftoff. So that, in fact, will be the last major physical change that we see to the pad. Uh, but this crew access arm retraction um, is the final, uh, will be the final state for the access arm for launch. This retraction should take about a minute to complete. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, the range continues to be go for launch, monitoring the clearance area around the launch pad, as well as air and sea space around the flight corridor. Uh, and of course, uh, here at Kennedy Space Center, as you see on your screen, uh, the conditions are gorgeous. Uh, everything continues to be acceptable for launch. Many things go into consideration, such as ground winds, uh, any rain that might be in the area, as well as potential for lightning, any thick clouds, and of course, as I mentioned before, downrange landing zones. Uh, we have mentioned before that we've been tracking those, but everything continues to look green for launch. Um, at this point in time, everything is looking on time uh, for our liftoff at noon Eastern. We can see that crew access arm continuing to retract. Pretty cool shot there from inside the arm on the right-hand side of your screen as we see Dragon slowly move out of the frame. So with all that being said, the teams are ready. Uh, we will begin the propellant load at T minus 35 minutes. Uh, and we are getting excited here at SpaceX headquarters. The energy is definitely starting to pick up outside of mission control. Uh, but with that, let's hand it off to Daryl to check in back over there at Kennedy Space Center. So I want to um, quickly show you something to give you a feeling for it. Um, the major success here of uh, SpaceX. And um, just two days ago, they actually had another Starlink mission. They had already an, an 181 total launches, 143 long, uh, landings uh, and 119 refills. It's just, um, just, just, just amazing. Um, you know, the, the, the mission successes, you know, like the whole Starlink uh, effort of uh, putting satellites in, in uh, LEO, so in, in lower orbit. It's just uh, amazing, uh, the success rate and uh, the efficiency, so to say, while I'm scrolling down here, uh, that SpaceX has, ha has had. So, um, you know, if you see the, 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 the number of uh, launches that they have, it's just amazing in a few years after they are finally able to, years ago, make this Falcon 9 be reusable. Uh, just amazing. And uh, we hopefully will be miss, uh, witnessing, witnessing today this launch here. Uh, just amazing um, that we can, uh, just gorgeous view here on, on the... There they are. Uh, from the NASA live feed here right. just a second ago. Cosmonaut Anna Kikina. So T minus thirty five was uh, launch, uh, not launch, <laughs> the Wakata. propellant um, fueling starting. Um, and there they're getting into position to begin their procedure that'll have them forming view. that launch escape system that you mentioned. Uh, they'll be able to hear some uh, clicking of valves and follow along on their display screen as uh, once they've kicked off that procedure, as the the vehicle kind of catches up and completes that arming sequence. And as you know, uh, once the fueling operations uh, begin, uh, the crew has to be ready to potentially launch uh, somewhere uh, if there was sort of some sort of a problem. And so that launch escape system.
system needs to be in place and armed in preparation for that fueling operation to begin. That system will stay armed throughout the ascent phase until the crew is actually safely in orbit, allowing them a, a safe way to escape from the Falcon 9 rocket should there be any sort of a, a problem with the vehicle. And we're expecting to see the astronauts close their visors and arm the launch escape system. This is just an amazing view, an amazing view. Look at this flying around here. From the launch team. You'll also see them uh, ensure that their feet are in the appropriate uh, locked-in position, their straps are tight, uh, because again, should that system be required, uh, they might be going for a, a pretty significant dynamic ride. But uh, of course, we don't expect that to happen today, uh, but they'll have that system uh, in place uh, just in case as the appropriate safety measure. Yeah, Bob, that launch escape system, powered by Super Draco engines, capable of moving Dragon a half a mile in just seven and a half seconds which is equivalent to a peak velocity of 436 miles per hour. I know you know this system well. You were very much like briefed and very aware of its capabilities. You now want to be able to not only get off the launch pad, but also get off the rocket while in flight. So it's got to move fast. Absolutely, Daryl. And for shuttle systems, you know, the crew would really have to do a lot of manual activities to, to steer the vehicle uh, through the uh, appropriate escape or abort uh, scenarios as we talked about them in those days. Uh, but this system is highly automated and the crew primarily follows along with its operations. Dragon, okay. you are go for section seven of 4.100 to close visors and arm the launch escape system. So let's get ready to rumble here. Game's on. SpaceX Dragon Copy stepping into Section 7. All crew visors are closed. We are arming the launch escape system. SpaceX copies all. That's Commander Nicole Mann reporting back and confirming. Their visors are closed. They are ready to arm the launch escape system. And you can see the crew members uh, pulling their straps and ensuring that they are, they are buckled in because uh, from a crew perspective, uh, that relaxation period that I talked about earlier is now over. Mm. Yeah, it's all business now. Want to yep. make sure that you're in your seat firm and tight. Ah, look at this nice view. The operation this is feeling. just amazing. This is also the Look part at of the this tiny thing here is the four astronauts training, inside you know, here. You really can't just uh, amazing. Uh, capture the this tones. Is on countdown one. Launch escape system is verified armed. Okay. All right, we got the verification of the armed. I can't system. wait. I hope I will have experienced this in my lifetime. So from a training have actually perspective, the sounds space and, travel. and things that the crew will hear during the loading operation are just different than they're able to capture from a training perspective. And so now is when it starts view. to, again, be a little bit different from a crew. You see down here the... There's no simulation. The construction that is uh, actually the rocket sitting on top, so you will have this. Falcon from... 9 tanks will be venting for the start of prop load. Expect loud venting. So you'll see, you also should be able to see some. To capture with the uh, Demo 1 uh, uh, audio, if you will. But uh, as you heard in the, the comm that uh, just came through there, you know, you need to get reminded to expect loud venting during some of the operations. And these are new things from a crew perspective that uh, you've been briefed on, but now you're going to hear them for the first time. See the time. helicopter flying here Three in the background. The four crew members inside that capsule right now have never flown to space before. They are first-time flyers. The lone exception, Koichi Wakata. Like I'm veteran. saying, you, they, uh, they are sitting on this construction uh, uh, or structure where the fumes uh, are getting cooled down in here and in two or three spots, the cloud kind of releases uh, to uh, to di divers, uh, divert the, the thrust, so to say, or the fumes ultimately. Or Artemis, uh, as we move towards that, these experiences are all slightly different. And so uh, I'm excited to hear, you know, Koichi's discussion as he tries to balance and describe uh, all three of them side by side when he gets back from this mission. <laughs> Would love to hear him talk about the, the comparisons. There's only a few of uh, a few astronauts like him, right, that have been able to fly on here. all three vehicles. 
Yes, Just and, and as we go forward here view. with the uh, you see here the um, coming forward, I'm excited to have folks this compare tunnel, and contrast uh, you know, that their blast can come out here you know, on the SLS right side here because uh, a lot of fumes <laughs> That's gonna be fun. stepping out, of course, uh, for about the first couple of moments. And then Just a few seconds now. I'm still amazed that the whole construction site here or the site here, uh, you know, it's not destroyed by the flames. So the, the way that they, they redirect it, um, Falcon 9 rocket. everything that's here then stays kind of safe and the blast is, you know, probably in this area here and then goes up uh, for the few seconds that it's actually uh, going up. Just a gorgeous all-around view. It's until just that amazing. So we have T-35 here. Propellant loading has started. So uh, Dragonfly going by. And so it begins. The loading of propellant aboard uh, the Falcon 9 rocket, liquid oxygen, and RP-1. Got your propellant yeah, so I'm going to actually oxidizer, move myself out of the view here. Which blended together, made quite the combustion, millions of pounds of thrust to get Crew-5 into space. You know, there are a lot of details to that operation, Daryl, with the each of the stages. And as you mentioned, the oxidizer and the fuel both needing to be loaded. And so this is just uh, the crew will follow along with that view. carefully I mean, as amazing. the uh, loading operation commences. Uh, see if there was any reason for them to here, need down to here. stop that operation, uh, uh, and the, the left crew here would expect that, to that that propellant um, loading So they actually, when they get the rocket so there, they transport it there out of the wall and then operation lift it up. Forward, you see this lift arm back here, out of it. Uh, to keep it straight. And we got a social and, question and now from um, Ad Grant B117, who asks, how long does it take to complete the fueling operations? You know, it's a great question, Daryl, and, and they started it at uh, 35 minutes because that's really prior to liftoff because that's how really how long it takes for the loading operations to kind of get executed. Uh, the, the crew goes through the process, the ground team, of, of loading that propellant, uh, ensuring that they get the proper commodities on board. Uh, the actual sequencing of things might be affected a little bit by the temperature uh, on a given day, but uh, they have that, that process well monitored, and they begin at 35 minutes because uh, that's how long it takes uh, to, to get the rocket all fueled up. Thank you for asking or for answering those questions. And to you out there for asking the questions, keep them coming. Hashtag Ask NASA on our various social platforms. And again, now that fueling for Falcon 9 has started, that means the eight Super Draco engines inside Crew Dragon are ready, if needed, to launch the capsule away from Falcon 9 in an instant, should there be any kind of emergency associated with the rocket or the pad. The NASA and SpaceX teams have trained extensively for exactly that type of contingency. And so now let's go over to Kate Tice at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne for another operations update. Kate. Thanks, Daryl. You can probably tell by the background noise that uh, things are starting to get more exciting now that we're just uh, practically 30 minutes away from launch of Crew-5, certainly counting down the final minutes. Everything's still looking good for Falcon 9 and Dragon. Uh, with that launch escape system now armed, we are heading for an on-time launch uh, just 32 minutes from now. As you saw, uh, Falcon 9 propellant load began right on time at T minus 35 minutes. The first and second stages of Falcon 9 are each loaded with two liquid propellants. One is fuel, which is loaded into a tank at the bottom of each stage, and the other is an oxidizer, and that's loaded into a tank at the top of each stage. The fuel that we use to power the Merlin engines is a refined kerosene referred to as RP-1 or rocket propellant 1. Uh, the oxidizer loaded on each stage is a densified liquid oxygen or LOX. Densified means that it's kept much colder than typical for launch vehicles, and it takes up less volume. And as such, this allows for more oxidizer to be loaded into the first and second stages. Now, to ignite the fuel and oxidizer in the Merlin rocket engine, we use an ignition fluid called TTEP. When TTEP comes into contact with oxygen, it burns, giving off a green-colored flame. Once we have that flame going, we add in the kerosene fuel to the Merlin chamber, and the engine ramps up to full power. You might actually be able to see that green flash just as the second stage engine ignites following stage separation, uh, which is expected to happen about two minutes and 48 seconds into flight. 
Right now, we're topping off helium into pressure vessels on both stages. Uh, this is used to pressurize tanks in flight as propellant is pulled out of those tanks by the Merlin turbo pumps. Now, on board the spacecraft, the astronauts are monitoring systems from their crew Stage monitors. Cryo helium loading has started. All right, there we just heard that the cryo helium load has begun. Again, that is going into those uh, pressure vessels that I mentioned earlier. Now, the crew training simulator uh, has included playback of the sounds that uh, were recorded in a previous Dragon capsule uh, during recent flights. So all of the pops and the hisses that the vehicle puts out, um, all the crew has heard those before, though not live. Uh, so they are prepared for all the noises, the extra noises that they're now hearing. Uh, as for the range, continues to report no problems. They are go to support launch. Weather also clearly looking great. I think we're actually seeing even fewer clouds than we were about 20 minutes ago. Uh, we had a less than 10% chance or probability of violation of our weather constraints, also known as a POV. Uh, so that's really good. Uh, that is for um, the launch site conditions. We are also tracking downrange weather conditions as well as uh, launch sites around the world in the unlikely event that Dragon needs to escape. Now, as a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch time because we're heading to the International Space Station. So at this point in time, if we hear a hold for any reason, we will have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity, uh, which is tomorrow, just under 24 hours from today's planned launch. Uh, at this point in time, at just under T minus 30 minutes till launch, let's turn it back over to Jesse and Sandra for an overview of what's to come until liftoff. Great. Thanks, Kate. Always great to hear that we've got good weather and it looks beautiful over there at KSC. For Crew 5, the astronauts' flight to station will take about 29 hours. And as we await T0 in just about 28 minutes from now, the ground operations team is doing a series of system checks to make sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for launch. You're looking at a live view of our teams at the Cape as they prepare for liftoff and as we wait for the launch clock to hit zero we want to give you an overview of what the ascent portion of the mission will look like now once we hit t0 and a successful launch occurs we will watch falcon 9 and dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39a and make their ascent about 50 seconds into flight falcons nine engines will throttle down to half to help pass through the period of a maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as max Q. At this point in time, the vehicle will be going supersonic. Now, once we're through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our nine Merlin engines again. From there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that will happen in rapid succession. The first is MECO, or Main Engine Cutoff, and this is where all nine Merlin 1D engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which is, of course, our second event. This is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, and the first stage will make its way back to Earth for landing, while the second stage continues on its journey with the third event, which is SES-1, or second stage engine start number one. And this is where the MVAC engine lights up and propels the second stage, along with our Crew-5 astronauts, to orbit. As Stage 2 heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, Stage 1 will execute two burns in order to make its way back down to Earth. The first is the entry burn, and that's where three of the nine M1D engines will reignite and shut down. And this helps to slow the stage down in preparation for entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. While the first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its one Merlin engine that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we will wait for confirmation of a good orbital insertion. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn is just a single engine burn, powerful enough to bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to touch down on the drone ship at about nine and a half minutes into the mission. While Falcon 9's first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. About three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. 
Once Dragon is a short distance away, it will begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. And it is worth noting that these are not the Super Draco engines that would be used during an abort scenario. About 40 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin. It will take roughly four minutes for the nose cone hooks to unlatch and open, exposing its guidance navigation controls that will help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. And lastly, once the nose cone is deployed, the remaining Draco thrusters on the forward bulkhead will be checked. From there, over Stage the next... Stage two, cryo-helium loading has started. From there, over the next 29 hours, Dragon will be in its rendezvous and approach phases, undergoing a number of phasing burns as it makes its way back to station. All that will be coming up soon, but for now, let's check back in with Shaniqua in Mission Control Houston. Shaniqua? Thanks, Sandra. The flight control is here and Mission Control Houston are laser focused on the onboard systems of the space station, making sure it is ready to receive Dragon vehicle tomorrow. They're also making sure communication links between the station, Dragon and the ground are working properly. The consensus right now is that everything is proceeding nominally. Teams here in Mission Control Houston, the teams in Hawthorne, and the astronauts aboard the space station See will monitor right here. the autonomous Live docking of the Dragon ISS. spacecraft tomorrow I evening. The They'll here perform too. a series of leak checks, so then work to the, open the hatches both on the Dragon side and inside the space station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to take place around an hour and a half after docking. And once aboard, the astronauts will be greeted by station commander Samantha Christopher Reddy and then the whole station will station crew will join in from for welcoming remarks to the new crew members now due to critical science this welcoming remarks will be about 90 minutes after the crew is on board once on board the crew members will no longer be referred to as crew 5 but rather as flight engineers of the international space station here in mission control flight director greg whitney is on console overseeing the team for launch and he will be back tomorrow for docking. We'll be on air continuously through Crew 5's arrival, but live coverage of docking is expected tomorrow around 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time. That's it from now from Mission Control Houston. I'll toss it back to the team in Florida. Dar Daryl, how's it looking? Well, it's one side. Crew 5 from Historic Launch Complex 39A, a beautiful sweeping shot of the lawn where we have our special guests, the media, uh, are here. We've got... So uh, while, I was, while they were talking, I didn't want to interrupt the commentary. So what I was showing at the while they were explaining was actually the uh, the way to the space station. So you saw you saw that earlier here when she was explaining. Um, you could see the, the path uh, it, it, it's taken, like she explained, you know, uh, to meet, it takes some time to get there, and then the final docking uh, part of that—that's what I was showing. You can refer to the link on top um, to see it, uh, to see more information also on uh, on uh, the space station and uh, the crew missions here, cargo missions before, and uh, crew missions to to get to the ISS. Wow. It's been two years. It feels like it was yesterday.
towards liftoff. A couple things that are coming up as we count down. We're going to have stage two RP1 load complete. Yeah, sorry, at the volume off here, the, we're just saying uh, uh, the demo two, two mission was two years ago. That's why I said, you know, it's been such, it seems like yesterday. That but, will um, begin in order to set the stage for the stage two liquid oxygen load. propellants load is not an exact science but once it completes we'll hear that call out stage two rp1 load is complete and there you heard it let's talk a little bit about the crew if you're just joining us we have a four-person crew that we call crew five and it's commanded by nicole mann she holds a Master of Science Marine in Corps. Mechanical Engineering and is a colonel in the Marine Corps. She was an F-A-18 Hornet and Super Hornet test pilot and deployed twice aboard aircraft carriers in support of combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Nicole was selected by NASA in June of 2013 and in the years that followed, led the astronaut corps in the development of hardware for our Artemis program. Today, the Crew-5 commander will be flying into space for the first time and once she reaches space, she will be the first Native American woman to stay on station. A historic first for NASA and for her. Absolutely, Daryl. The astronaut corps is a widely diverse, and I'm just proud to see Nicole join that crew on board the International Space Station. With her is pilot Josh Cassida. He grew up in Bear Lake, Minnesota. The physicist and U.S. Navy test pilot flew the P-3C and the P-8A, as well as 23 combat missions. He later became an instructor at the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School, which is a path to NASA for military officers. Cassida is one of more than 100 graduates who have become astronauts, going all the way back to the Mercury program. More recently, he served as capsule communicator in mission control, but today he is the pilot aboard Dragon. It's a seat I know well, and I look forward to seeing Josh support Nicole and the rest of the crew on their way towards the International Space Station. The mission specialist now, Koichi Wakata, He's the veteran, a Japanese astronaut who has a doctorate in aerospace engineering. In 1986, wow, he became the first Japanese mission specialist aboard the space shuttle Endeavor for STS-72. Altogether, Koichi four, times four STS. space shuttle missions, a Roscosmos Soyuz, and was on a long-duration stay aboard the International Space Station. During his two-decade career as an astronaut, Koichi has spent 11 months in space. Bob, you wow. spent a fair amount of time in space yourself. It's great to have a veteran aboard. It, it absolutely is. And uh, in addition to being a veteran, uh, Koichi just has a wonderful personality that I know is just a, it's key to kind of success on board the space station. Our second mission specialist is Roscosmos cosmonaut Anna Kikina. She graduated from the Novosibirsk State Academy of Water Transport in 2006. In 2012, Anna officially became a candidate for the position of test cosmonaut. Crew 5 will be Anna's first flight into space, along with two of her other fellow astronauts. Now, each of these four crew members will be part of Expedition 68 once they arrive at the International Space Station. And there you see them there inside Crew Dragon Endurance, the second flight for this Dragon. So um, it's just amazing, these uh, specialists, I'll call them, because uh, it's, you know, it's not like pilot piloting means that you have a lever and you maneuver the spacecraft necessarily, a lot of automation, of course, going on, but um, not, not to underestimate the knowledge these, have, these folks have to accumulate to, uh, to be able to, um, you know, be on this mission and then on this mission on ISS, because they're actually doing work on at, at just got the call out that the stage two locks load has started putting that liquid propellant into the second stage. So, uh, yeah, to not to underestimate this to, you know, to have this career, to be able to, to do that. Uh, it's a lot of training, uh, to, to get this right, uh, in these missions. So 
Thanks, Daryl. We are T minus 16 minutes away from launch and everything continues to look great for Falcon 9 and Dragon. Uh, Falcon 9 began prop load at T minus 35 minutes. Um, the loading of RP-1 fuel on the second stage is complete. Uh, that finished at T minus 20 minutes. Fuel loading continues on the first stage. Uh, it is almost complete. That should be wrapping up here momentarily. Um, Densified liquid oxygen loading is underway on both the first and second stages. Those look to be about 80% on the first stage and uh, has only just recently begun on the second stage. So not much there yet. That will, those, that will wrap up at T minus three minutes and T minus two minutes respectively. Now as for checkouts of thrust vector controllers, uh, what we call TVC wiggles, those are coming up. Uh, we basically check to make sure that the thrust vector controllers are able to actuate the engines themselves. Um, they, that's, what, that's what helps create gimbal uh, for those engines and, and gimbaling is actually how Falcon 9 steers itself. Uh, so those are coming up along with throttle valve checkouts on the engines. The Dragon mission director and team are currently reporting no issues, so really good on that front. Communication checkouts are complete. The crew access arm is retracted, as we can see there, and the crew is strapped in and ready to go, as you can see there on the right-hand side of your screen. Everybody continuing to monitor prop load there on their crew monitors. Now, final instructions to the crew come at T minus 10 minutes. At that point, their crew displays will be configured for launch. This setup gives the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding uh, and provides constant updates on vehicle health. At T minus five minutes, we'll hear the call out uh, that will be in terminal count. And at that point, Dragon will transition to internal power. We'll hear continued call outs on the countdown nets as we get closer to liftoff. As for range, they continue to be go, continuing to monitor the launch corridor uh, and everything remains green. As for weather, we're looking at seven mile per hour winds at the launch site. And as I said before, as the countdown continues, we are seeing fewer and fewer clouds. Just an absolutely stunning day there at Kennedy Space Center. Let's check back in with Daryl to see uh, the last couple minutes prior to liftoff. Thanks, Kate, and it really couldn't be more perfect out here weather-wise for a launch. How about that, Bob? It just looks uh, absolutely stunning to look out and see the, the vehicle ready to go, the crew on board strapped in. I'm just super excited for them. And there's a view of the countdown clock and the historic American flag that has been standing there since the space shuttle program. Now you're looking at a pic of uh, Crew 5. Crew 5 flying aboard the Dragon Capsule Endurance, and the booster that you see behind them that they're posing with is a brand new one. Actually, it was damaged in transit from California to Texas, but it was fixed, repaired. The crew did a great job, the SpaceX team, in getting it all ready. And at the time that Falcon 9 launches Dragon to space, the International Space Station will be 260 statute miles over Australia. Crew 5 will then spend the next 21 hours with mission control team that you see there in Houston, standing by, getting ready for the beginning of this mission. They'll spend 21 or 29 hours, rather, chasing down the International Space Station for a rendezvous at 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow evening. One of the longer transits, Bob. What I find amazing that, um, you know, like this is a new rocket um, and that uh, this manufacturing process of SpaceX where they can actually, you know, produce another rocket and deliver the same quality, meaning flawless production, no other mistakes possible, you know, possible. Uh, and um, I always wish them Godspeed in, in, in this manufacturing process. And also for us as humanity going forward, that we can actually uh, make use of uh, uh, rockets like this in the future, like the spaceship uh, and uh, the, the bigger rocket uh, to to use, you know, for us to travel to space and to colonize Mars and uh, get out there. And who knows, maybe we'll find ways to travel faster and first of all, travel through space for longer periods of time and, and surviving as human beings and then being uh, independent of Earth on Mars. And then maybe, you know, we can hop, hop, hop uh, hop uh, out into into space. Uh, so 
this process here of creating these rockets that are reliable uh, is just uh, amazing. So uh, wish the wish the crew good luck, Godspeed, and uh, um, safe travels. Take it away, Kate. Thanks, Daryl. As you can probably tell by the background noise, the crowd is definitely growing here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Uh, certainly one of our company traditions is to watch the launch itself from behind Mission Control, which you see there on your screen. Uh, you can see this is Mission Control Hawthorne, or as you sometimes hear referred to as uh, MCCX. And then, of course, a uh, crowd of employees watching from behind. I personally also stand there if I'm not doing the webcast, so I can confirm it's a great spot to watch launch. Um, I, like I said, as you can see, the, the energy is certainly starting to grow now that we're about great to Great view again here. Minus. Just awesome to have these close-ups and aerial shots. Just amazing. Um, So we're getting ready here, 10 minutes. Welcome. We would like to give a huge thanks to the NASA and SpaceX team, the thousands of people for their development, preparation, and training in getting Endurance and Crew 5 to the launch pad today, and your continued support in helping to make this a successful mission. We look forward to joining the rest of our Expedition 68 crew members aboard the International Space Station. And a special thanks on behalf of all the crew, to our family and friends. It is your love and support that help make dreams come true. Now let's do this. Crew 5 displays are configured for launch. Copy, and Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna, on behalf of the entire team at SpaceX, good luck, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. And those words from Nicole Mann, the first female commander of a dragon, as she thanked the many folks that have helped get them to this point. We're now less than nine minutes away from launch today. I kind of wish they would show the other view from um, the lady who just talked, you know, that they have a camera. They used to have a camera on this side. Uh, maybe then when, once we go into countdown, they will show the other view. Uh, it's just amazing to look inside the capsule uh, and, and into this uh, futuristic but uh, current real uh, spacecraft here. So, And those will come into play once the second stage kicks in, lasting from the top of North Carolina all the way to the tip of Newfoundland in the northern Atlantic. You'll also hear a spot that is to be avoided, and you might hear Shannon or a foreword to Shannon, and that actually refers to Shannon, Ireland, meaning they would target off the east coast of Ireland if they were later in that second stage and did need to abort for some reason. So the next major milestone that we're looking towards will come just seconds from now, and that will be when engine chill begins on the first stage of the engine. That's that right. View. So engine chill is basically when we take a little bit of that super chilled densified liquid oxygen and we flow it through the turbo pumps of the Merlin M1D engines on the first stage. This helps to prepare the turbo pumps and avoid any thermal shock to the hardware when they see the full flow of liquid oxygen during ignition. Uh, we're also expecting the uh, conclusion of uh, prop load um, for the RP-1 on first stage to wrap up at T minus six minutes. Locks load continues to be underway on both first and second stages. Again, wrapping those uh, at T minus three minutes and two minutes. T minus seven. And after that, we'll hear a number of call outs related to Dragon's flight computer. Some will stage be the- one engine chill has started. And you did just hear that call out that stage one engine chill has begun. Coming up in just about 45 seconds, we should expect to hear that RP-1 load is complete. RP-1 load is that densified kerosene or rocket fuel that will help propel the crew into orbit. All of that RP-1 is loaded into the first stage and we are standing by to hear that it was uh, loaded into the second stage as well. Again, we expect that to wrap at T minus six minutes. Uh, the venting that you see on screen is totally normal. That is just some Stage of- Stage one, RP-1 load is complete. 
great news there that RP1 load is now finished. Um, as I was saying, the venting that you see on the vehicle is totally normal. That's just some of the super chilled, densified liquid oxygen uh, uh, just vaporizing as it comes into contact and vents from the vehicle. And coming up, we'll also hear the call for Dragon to configure for terminal count, and then it will be transferred over to internal power. And then we'll hear that propellant tanks on Falcon 9 are getting ready to pressurize, which helps add some additional rigidity and structural support as we get ready for strong back retract. Getting excited that here. Back will retract a couple of degrees at first and then we will see it swing open completely uh, just shortly or at the moment of lift off. Nine tanks will be pressurizing for strong back retract. And there's that indication that we are preparing for that strong back retraction. Coming up in just a few seconds, we should hear that Dragon is in terminal count. Dragon is in configure for terminal count. All right, there we heard that call. Dragon onboard computers have now taken control of the vehicle. As I mentioned before, first stage locks or liquid oxygen loading is underway and will wrap up at T minus three minutes. So you see the stages here, that's stage Second one. Stage, wrap its locks load at T -minus stage two, two and then the capsule on Launch top here. Continue to report no with issues its engines. And everything remains green and for an on So if I'm so correct, the, the arm will retract here. That's why they're closing up on this. And here in just a couple seconds, you might be able to see the strong back arm as it does begin to retract. As Kate said, it will recline two degrees. We can just barely make out the, the, the clamp, on, the clamp, clamp arms here. are now beginning to move. All right, now that those clamp arms are removed, as Sandra said, this will retract by two degrees. Uh, and then at liftoff, the strong back will retract another to full five degrees, uh, allowing Falcon 9 to clear. Strong back is part of the transporter erector, and the transporter erector is what provides uh, the liquids, the gases, the electrical connections to the vehicle. It's also what we use to integrate the vehicle. See, there's actually some movement here. Position, and you can see that two degrees Wiggling just, just a little bit. Point. Look at the structure, 100 meters. Um, and the next call out that's that Starship, we should I'm sorry, in about 20 less, seconds but... is that the first stage locks load is complete. Wow. Stage one locks load is complete. And there we go. All of the oxidizer loaded on stage one. T minus three. Soon we'll hear Mounting. that stage two locks load is complete. And that will be the last propellant call out we'll hear today. Now less than three minutes until launch. Dragon is in terminal count and is on internal power. All right, there we heard the good news that Dragon is now on internal power. Again, the white clouds that you see there at the base of the dragon trunk, totally normal. That's just the vapor uh, from the liquid oxygen. Again, second stage now wrapping up its lock load. Excuse me, first stage wrapping up its lock load um, just a few minutes ago, and now moving toward wrap up of second stage lock load, which will complete at T minus two minutes. Coming up on two minutes until liftoff, standing by for word that stage two locks load has been completed. Come on, give us the completion here. Dragon is in auto idle. Stage two locks load is complete. There we've got the call out. Myself Falcon over here. 9 is now completely fueled. Wow. All of its propellants. So yeah, close out. Our starting. Expect loud ending. Uh, all of its propellants, and we can see that leftover liquid oxygen uh, now being Always vented excited or released, to see this. Uh, now flowing further away from the vehicle. So nearly 1 million pounds of liquid oxygen in RP1 now on board Falcon 9. It is fully wow. loaded and ready for launch.
And Got coming speed. up at T minus one minute, we'll hear that Dragon is in countdown. Its flight computer will switch to countdown mode and we'll hear that the flight termination system on Falcon 9 is FPS armed. FPS is armed, Falcon 9 is in startup and is now controlling. And there you heard it, Dragon's, Dragon is in countdown. Dragon's flight computer in countdown, the flight termination system now armed. We should get the final go for launch from SpaceX launch director Mark Sirtis. SpaceX, Godspeed, go for launch. SpaceX Dragon, go for launch. SpaceX reports go, seconds. crew reports go, 30 seconds until liftoff. This is happening. See the cooling starting here. Water being pumped in here and to cool the up here too. Water. And we have liftoff. Yes. Wow. Look at that. I love the birds flying now. Vehicle is pitching down range. Stage one propulsion is nominal. We're now at T plus 35 seconds. 600 kilometers now already. I love the weather because we get great views now. I'm gonna actually pull myself over to the other side here. Next up is going to be a couple of events in rapid succession. First will be engine chill on the second stage and back engine. And there you heard that call out. And then we'll have Miko or main engine cutoff where the nine engines igniting will cut off in preparation for second stage separation. Then we'll this. see the single Merlin vacuum really see engine the on the second stage here. ignite and continue to carry the crew five From the camera, to orbit. already that far up, 45 kilometers, wow. Just like we did on first stage, that MVAC chill is intended to help pre-chill the hardware prior to the full flow of that densified liquid oxygen. So yeah, uh, should have made Miko there. At this point in time, those nine Merlin engines are beginning to throttle down in preparation for Miko or main engine cutoff. 72 kilometers altitude. Standing by for Miko. And Miko. Stage two alpha. And Stage separation confirmed. Copy two alpha. Look at that. There we should see that second engine begin to ignite now. And obviously confirmed by the loud cheer behind us here. Look how it turns right. I love that view. The left side is Falcon 9 going down. This is just gorgeous views. Left to us, Falcon 9, the fans the first stage, uh, after that stage separation, steering it back to Florida here. Still being illuminated by that single Merlin vacuum engine, and that's on the right hand side of your screen. Yeah. First stage on the left hand side of your screen, making its way back to Earth. We will be attempting to land it on our drone ship, um, which today we are using just read the instructions. And we did hear that acquisition of the ground station in Bermuda. 
The first stage is continuing to make its way back to Earth, and the second stage is going to continue. So you Another see good on the left. Trajectory nominal. Yep. I see on the left uh, already. You see the coast line again. there from Commander Nicole Mann. You can also sort of see the, the space coast there in the yep. background of the first stage on the left-hand side of your screen. It also looks like you can actually see the thrust plume uh, created by the first stage as it's now rotating just out of screen. Yeah, look on the left there already. Second Above stage is going to continue firing until a little over eight minutes into the flight, really doing the heavy lifting now, getting the crew into orbit. Everything continues to look nominal on both first and second stages. As I mentioned before, the first stage will be making uh, a, a landing on one of our drone ships, which is currently parked a couple hundred miles off the coast of Florida in the Atlantic oh, Ocean. So we can see left now side that Falcon uh, 9 is, uh, it's going to take another good confirmation less than there four that minutes, I think, to come back down. The second stage now traveling over 5,400 miles per hour. Crew is pulling a little more than 1G right now. That's going to continue to ramp up, peaking just before we get to second stage cutoff here in just a few minutes from now. First stage will be performing two separate burns, a re-entry burn where we reignite three of the Merlin back, or excuse me, the Merlin M1D engines on the first stage. Uh, we ignite the center engine into radial, radial engines to help slow it down as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. And then the second final burn, and that will be the landing burn on our drone ship. And the single M back engine Great. that you see. Trajectory the single M back engine that you see see on the right of your screen is continuing to fire. We did hear another call out that trajectory is nominal. Crew heading in the direction that they are supposed to be. This single engine can produce over 220,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space. Now over 200 kilometers in altitude. We will start to hit events now in a rapid succession as the first stage continues up anymore, so to make its way back to Earth, altitude, and the so second stage continues its burn. Just a couple minutes left in that burn. So they're just going to get pick up speed to. Just uh, joining us, just over six and a half minutes ago, uh, our four Crew Five astronauts launched from Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and they are now making their way into orbit. You can on see the, the Falcon stage, Nine here well, falling down now. Uh, Pretty well. Which we're hearing that the yeah, trajectory on that is nominal. Uh, copy. They are in safe inside uh, Dragon Endurance, whereas the first stage on the left-hand side of your screen uh, is making its way back to Earth. We are coming up to the re-entry burn, which, as I said before, we ignite three of the nine. So you Merlin see the thrusters here to help uh, slow automatically the adjusting the position the so that the Earth's uh, atmosphere. It gets to where it's supposed to be. See the As fans, the, entry burn the fins we'll moving. The entry burn start up. So there we go. The call out. So that's the start of burn. Entry burn here for that Falcon that 9. That entry burn has been initiated. That just slows it down significantly. And as that entry burn completes, we'll be in the final um, different abort phases here shortly, which essentially correspond to areas along the very northeastern seaboard of the U.S. Stage and then, one entry burn shut down. Great news that entry burn was shut down, and then those last all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, Atlantic off the coast of Scotland for those abort zones. Everything continues to look nominal for both the first and second stage stages. And the crew with the second stage still attached is now traveling over 13,000 miles per hour. 24,000 miles per hour. About 10 seconds wow. away from Seco 1. Copy, Shannon. Shannon, that call out. 
that call out for Shannon Ireland, indicative of our final abort zone. After this, we'll see second stage shut off and we'll be listening for confirmation of a good orbit, which tells us the crew and Dragon are exactly and where they need to be. Up. There we had confirmation that the impact has shut down simultaneously. Uh, the entry. Stage one should be landing. Uh, and you oh. heard that call for a good insertion. There he goes. We'll coast for oh a few God, this is science fiction live. There I we can it. see the drone ship coming into view as Falcon 9 Launch attempts. Stage one landing like deployed. You can see those landing, landing legs have now deploy. deployed. See the shadow of the last burn. Looks pretty smooth. Man, amazing technology. You can hear by the clapping and cheering behind me, Falcon 9 has landed on our drone ship just with the instructions, parked off the coast of Florida. And again, see that their second stage, stage two it was separation will stage be coming one, up just a couple back. of minutes now. Stage two is now still powering them. After second yeah, engine behind this horizon here, so to our motion to dampen out and settle. So this should uh, be released here, second engine. And looks like we're going to get a view of the second stage as it separates here shortly. Here. We did hear that the crew has been successfully inserted so into you see a the good nuts, orbit. Uh, it's been shut off. So 27,000 kilometers an hour, altitude of 199 kilometers where they want to be right now. This will be, sh this will be separated now. Again, the crew is still attached to the second stage. We are expecting stage separation to occur in just over a minute from now, about one minute and eight seconds. And that's when the, uh, excuse me, when the second stage will separate from the dragon trunk. Dragon Trunk is the part of hardware where we are able to house the uh, cargo that is able to be exposed to the vacuum of space, as well as the solar panels which help power Dragon while it is on orbit. Again, that stage separation is now coming up in about 30 seconds. After stage separation, we will have nose cone deployment. Now that Dragon is in the vacuum of space, we're able to, we will be able to open the nose cone and expose that forward hatch, which is what is utilized to dock uh, autonomously with the International Space Station. And that nose cone does stay closed for the flight up to hill to help protect all of the guidance, navigation, and control sensors. We are standing by for second stage separation. It should be about right now. And there is separation. Dragon separation confirmed. Nice. Some more space debris. Dragon is here, launch director on Dragon. On behalf of the entire launch and recovery team, it was an honor and a pleasure to be a part of this mission with you. And while October 3rd may belong to the main girls, October 5th will forever belong to Crew 5. Godspeed endurance. Cheers. Awesome. Thank you so much to the Falcon team. That was a smooth ride up here. We got three rookies that are pretty happy to be floating in space right now, and one uh, veteran astronaut who's pretty happy to be back as well. Let's see what you got to say, Kooji. Uh, Falcon team, uh, you know, it was a smooth ride, and uh, I see all the three happy faces here in, back in zero-G, and I appreciate all the help to give us a smooth ride and training, and thank you so much. Thank you for your support. Finally, some view of the screens here. 
agencies uh, to work to us most most uh, and JAXA uh, and C6 exactly for uh, giving us that opportunity. We so glad to do it together. And uh, thank you for everybody, for all people who is that. Спасибо большое всем агентствам Роскосмос, НАСА, ДАКСА и, естественно, SpaceX за предоставленную нам возможность. Мы рады всем экипажам делать то, что мы сейчас делаем. И большое спасибо всем людям, кто сейчас с нами. Some really nice words there from the Crew 5 crew as well as... And Dragon Falcon 9 you thanks for the words. Uh, had a great ride. Have a good mission. We'll see you later. A wonderful Mean Girls reference there by launch director uh, Mark Soltis, and then we just heard from Chief Engineer Dan Alex. And we just heard our first Quindar tone indicating the crew is Nominal in space. Humidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. Expect at Martha's Signal, New Hampshire. Well, with these impressions i will uh and kate it did look like we were getting our first views of that microgravity indicator i did see that as well i will leave you and leave this uh this uh, transmission here so you see a little stuffed animal that they have up here um so i hope you enjoyed this a uh, bit of commentary on the side and some side notes uh Give me a like, uh, subscribe to the channel uh, so you don't miss me uh, when I go do do live feeds and uh, on my shorts and my videos. Uh, check out my playlists. Uh, hope to see you 